Football hasn't always been a sport that is accessible for everyone. With most British men serving their country at war in 1918, women finally had their opportunity to play the beautiful game in a time of misery and despair. Throughout the duration of World War I, the respect towards women in society had increased, but in 1921, the sport was given a huge setback as women were banned from playing football competitively by the FA. And since then, the sport has changed exponentially. In this documentary, we'll explore how women's football has developed and moved on from its dark past, and discover how the progress of youth football, social media, grassroots football, government strategies, and the recent success of the Lionesses has propelled women's football to new heights. This is Women's Football, A New Era. I travelled to Basingstoke to speak to footballers Beth Lowe and Ayala Truelove, who have both noticed drastic and positive changes in the women's game whilst playing grassroots football. I think when I used to say to people like, oh, I can't go out or I can't do this on a Saturday because I've got a game on Sunday, I think people would be a bit like, what do you mean? No one really knew what you were talking about, whereas I feel like now people kind of take it a bit more seriously and they want to come and watch you or they ask about your game or they ask about how it's going. Whereas I think, yeah, growing up, I was always in a boys team and it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't the same as it is now. You used to take special kind of girls to play football. You know, ones who are really keen, really interested to break the barriers, you know, because it, it was a stigma to play football for girls. It, it, it just wasn't done, you know. And, and now it just becomes uh, completely acceptable. I think they're putting a lot more emphasis on getting, like, girls' teams, getting... Because it shouldn't just be girls playing in boys' teams. Yeah. Like, it's not the same thing as playing with other girls. Um, and I just think seeing that on TV and being around the conversation around successful women in sports, I think is going to be like amazing. I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> I'm kind of jealous of the younger generation. I was quite fortunate, actually. I think my school was, was one of the schools that you could play football as a girl. But I've heard a lot from girls in the team and also just people I speak to that are interested in football, that they never got to play it at school. But there's new kind of conversations happening around that and around how there should be no difference in sports between girls and boys. Like boys should be able to play netball and do gymnastics and girls should be able to play football and rugby. It's not just showing girls that they can have a career, it's showing a bigger variety of girls, you know, to almost all girls that they can actually, so sort of breaking that stigma, you know, that it's okay for girls to play football, you know, and remove that stigma. I love talking to the kids in my class about football and women's football. When I started, there was no girls in the team and now there's five. So mm. it's like, it's small steps, but they're seeing, oh, my coach is a woman or my coach is a girl. Like me, I can play if I want to and give it a go. In 2022, the FA Women's and Girls campaign announced a new four-year strategy titled Inspiring Positive Change, which outlined eight objectives to be achieved by 2024. One of these objectives being to give every primary school age girl the option to play football in schools or clubs but are the wheels for this strategy already in motion? I know when I was at school, there wasn't really much opportunity for girls in football. Um, hearing from my team, there is a lot more opportunity. They're playing matches, they're training, uh, like extra, extracurricular outside of school as well, uh, but still as part of the school team. So I think it's definitely progressed from when I was at school kind of 20 years ago. How often do you play football at schools? Do you play it in PE? Yeah, I, I join um, my school football team, so I go to like, their like, games and like training every week. Not like, loads, but in the summer, yeah, quite a lot. Um, no, Is that, do you not play football at all in PE or any subjects like that? I haven't for a while, but I think I do. Uh, I don't play in PE, but I would like to. Uh, we haven't had PE yet, no football yet in PE, but um, we might have it soon. Over the past five years or so, we've seen a massive increase in the amount of women and girls willing to play football from, you know, that real entry level of or, or beginner age of five or six all the way through to the senior game. 
Um, so we're definitely seeing more opportunities arise in local community clubs um, and within the talent pathway as well for women and girls to get involved. And, and that's something that's increasingly growing now, especially off the back of the momentum we've gained from the Euros. I went to Bath to speak to Millie Bellotti and Ruby Black, who are both aspiring young footballers with a dream to go pro. Bristol City remains the only female academy nearby Bath, which has resorted Millie and Ruby to try alternative routes into the England pathway. Millie and Ruby both played for Swindon Elite, an emerging talent centre that is designed to be a different route for girls who are on a journey to becoming a professional footballer. Unfortunately, in our area in the southwest, there's only one academy, which is Bristol City, and there's two pathways for the England pathway. So you can go the ETC route, which is like an emerging talent centre, or you can go RTC route, which is like a regional talent centre. But they're both quite similar in the way that they work, apart from an RTC is like academy based, it leads you into their academy team. Whereas like an ETC is more, it stops under 16s. So there is like a gap between under 16s and women's football, which I think is quite like hard between that age gap because there's no ETC, so you've either got to be in an academy or you've got to go straight to women's football. Because of the lack of academies in certain areas, so if you go up north, for example, you will find quite a lot of RTCs in one area, or if you go to London, you know, a lot of professional clubs will have RTCs because RTCs are generally linked to professional football clubs. And the difference between an RTC and an ETC is that you still play for your grassroots football yeah. and then you have extra coaching on top. Mm. So it's a different pathway, mm. but for many girls it's probably, it can be more successful. And because, because there's a belief that playing for grassroots when you're younger is really helpful and you're learning lots of different things, and to push kids at an early age isn't necessarily the right thing to do, so they're offering to Pathways, which I think is a good thing because it's definitely different in academy. I mean, we know mm. a lot of girls that have been to academy and haven't ended up feeling that great about themselves afterwards. Regional talent centres and emerging talent centres strive to help young women that want to become professional footballers. However, what about those who just want to have fun and enjoy the game? Organisations such as Football Beyond Borders make it their mission to target young people who are in need in schools, whilst also helping to fulfil whatever their passions in football may be. Football Beyond Borders use their social media platform to help empower women's football through videos such as the short documentary, The Spirit of the Game, which explores what football means to young women in the UK. Social media has proved to be a great vehicle in promoting women's football, with last year's record-breaking UEFA Women's Euros 2022 generating a staggering 453 million interactions across social media, with Twitter and TikTok contributing the most. So if you go to the BBC Sport and look at football, and look at the, some of the more prominent articles about women's football, and look at the comment section, there's still comments like oh women shouldn't be playing and so on so uh, very very negative comments mm. but i think i think i really do think it's a very small minority they're just making a lot of noise so <clears throat> i think that, you know the general population got a really positive attitude really got behind the women in the euro ma in a massive way so that was awesome with 23,000 followers on tiktok Portsmouth women's footballer Taylor McDonald has used her platform to help inspire other women to get involved in football, even with the hate that can come with social media. I think I've got a lot of positive, as you can imagine. Um, there's always like a few like boys that are like, oh, but you didn't do this right, you didn't do that right. But I think at the end of the day, they're hiding behind a screen and I'm the one doing it live for them, like there and then, so not much you can do about it. As long as bigger names are more positive I think they should be able to influence more people than what the trolls do. Has TikTok given you more opportunities in football? I think it's allowed more opportunities for me personally because I think more people are wanting to like branch into the women's sport um, which allows them to then ask me to help them so I think it's included by a bit. 
as well as social media, ambassadors such as Ian Wright have contributed to bringing more attention to the female game. I think especially when you have um, male allies such as Ian Wright and sort of Gary Lineker and stuff like that, I think it helps change the perception um, and move that along which, which, does, which does huge things for the development of the female game. The UEFA Women's Euros in 2022 gathered hype that has never been seen before in the women's game and became the driving force behind women's football. We were in tears. We were, at, we were actually quite, we were saying we were quite emotional really because from going from, you know, just in our lifetime to the fact that we started off at school not being allowed to play football um, to then being sat in Southampton um, Stadium with, you know, a crowd of... It was, it was sold out. It was sold out. It was so incredible. It was just, wow, I never thought I'd see that. You know, yeah. I never thought we'd see that in our lifetime. I tell you what, I just, when I, I've seen, I've seen, when to see England play, the, the Lions has played, not, not during the Euros, but in leading up games, warm up games and so on. And one thing that struck me the most was how many girls were there. And that was the biggest difference that I've seen in the previous games. And little girls, and it was just full of little girls, and they were screaming their heads off. They were wearing their shirts, and they were just unbelievably into it. And I went to see Arsenal a few weeks ago, women. And again, it was just full of girls uh, of all ages. So yeah, absolutely. Because that's, that's the headroom that women's football has got to grow. is not just from, from players, but also supporters. You know, women supporters who currently don't go and watch football, coming to, now coming to watch women's football. You always have your role models, you always have your idols uh, that you want to play like. And, you know, that's something that will definitely come from the triumph with the English team. Over 416,000 new opportunities were introduced by the FA in England across schools, clubs and in communities to help engage women and girls in grassroots legacy football activities. Consequently, there has been a 17% increase in female players across all levels of the game as well as a 30% increase in female registered football teams. I think it's a lot easier for people to now find opportunities that are local to them. Um, we have a tool called Find Football, which is online, where you can type in your postcode, your age, that kind of thing, and it brings up all the local opportunities that are nearby to you, whether that's competitive, 11v11, 9v9, whether that's recreational, you know, turn up and play. Um, so I think there's a lot more, as I said, opportunities available for people to go and do that. And not just playing, coaching, refereeing. After the Euros, and now it's much more accessible. You don't have to break that barrier in the same way. It's much more, you have a much more easier time as a girl to do it. Because nobody's going to look at you and say, what, what are you doing? You know, I'm kind of saying, are you... The most obvious way I used to say, well, you're a lesbian, you're playing football. You know, for girls. And, and so I think now it's much more accessible to everybody. That final, as I said, the momentum that we've now got from the Euros is is crazy. There's people emailing us every day asking, where can I play? You know, what's, you know, I've seen the Euros and it's really influenced me. I want to get involved. And that's the effect that a major tournament can have. You look at the Olympics and the legacy that that had and other major World Cups and Euros. It's That's what a tournament does. And the fact that it was on such a big stage and had so many viewings, both, you know, on TV and it, people attending, it just it highlighted it even more. So yeah, it's, it's been brilliant. In 2022, the average viewer watched eight hours and 44 minutes of women's sport, compared to three hours and 47 minutes in 2021. Domestically, it was a record year for women's sport, with 37.6 million watching it in 2022, compared to 32.9 million in 2021. The popularity of the Euros helped the Women's Super League pull in 16 million viewers during the 2022 calendar year, with attendances in grassroots and the Super League benefiting from this. It was a volcano, it forced it to kind of erupt. I think it was always bubbling away, but I think it definitely caused that final, and now yeah. people can't help but take notice of it. Our game's definitely from what it was last year. We are seeing more people now today. Uh, but it's still grassroots, I mean, it's not... Where you really see it is, is if you go and see Reading, uh, Reading Women play at the Manchester Stadium, and the attendance there, uh, I think, is twice about it was last year. You know, even in the planning stages of the tournament, we knew it was going to be popular. We've seen how far women's football has come recently, and there was no doubt in anyone's mind that 
we'd be chasing those targets down, those record targets of attendance at the game. And and when we did, it just shows, you know, how far we've come and how much work has been put in behind the scenes to put women's football on, on a pedestal and, sh and show it as a great sport that it is. With the World Cup in Australia and New Zealand coming up in 2023, there have been early suggestions that the tournament could be in jeopardy that would prevent the next step of growth for women's football. 15 members of the female Spain squad wrote to the Royal Spanish Football Federation, making themselves unavailable for World Cup selection. Could this halt women's football from developing and going into a new era? So, um, I don't think there's anything that can halt it. Um, I think I think the Lionesses have done such a good job of making themselves real pure role models that not only you know young girls can look up to, but older women. Do you think that this is a new era for women's football? I, I think so, yeah. I think. We've, the only reason why I'm cautious is because we've had sort of Paul Thorne before, but, but primarily around the, Olymp the Olympics in London, the London Olympics. Yeah. That was kind of an event that we looked at it and thought that's going to be the trigger, and it didn't quite deliver. Although in hindsight it did, it's just because on the back of that the WSL was formed, uh, and sudden uh, and, and women got the, the first professional contract and so on. So it did trigger to an extent, it just wasn't that real breakthrough that this Euro seems to be. Do you believe that it's a new era for women's football? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I think it's exciting. I'm excited to see what happens. Kind of makes me wish I was like 10 years younger and could be a bit more involved with it. It is very exciting. With the World Cup coming up this summer in Australia and New Zealand, the Lionesses have another opportunity to entertain new audiences around the globe. And with the success of last summer's Euros, the future is looking bright for women's football.